What's up everyone? It's currently winter and I'm very very bored because I'm barely breeding any insects at all. As some of you know I'm leaving my own country in a few months. Well actually in one month time so it's getting really close. And I don't want to leave all my insects behind when I leave this country to research insects in the tropics. So I barely have any livestock. The only exception is right now is things that can exclusively overwinter. So I'm going to show you what I'm overwintering because I'm preparing some species from, for when I return home back to my own country. Now coincidentally one of the most frequently asked questions on my channel is Bart how do you overwinter insects anyways? Well here we see a pile of trash including some old barbels plastic bags, a barbecue, garden, furniture and whatever, whatever else. However here in the, ba in the back, on a nice and cozy comfortable place, here we have my container with overwintering eggs. Hey, this is a little secret for me. Uh, sorry about my voice, I, I have uh, a cold, I have the flu right now. Of course I gotta have it when it's Christmas. Every year when it's Christmas I'm sick for some reason. But uh, let's take a look. This is how I overwinter eggs basically. They are in here in isolated little tubes. And they need no special care, no added humidity, no special warmth. Just follow nature, okay? If your eggs want to overwinter it probably means that your moth species is Palearctic in origin. That means they can handle the winter, okay? Unless you live in Russia or Poland, okay, where it gets minus 20 degrees. Okay, here they might die. But if you live in Germany, in, in, uh, in England, in the Netherlands, in Belgium, in North America, in New York, or I don't know, in uh, Canada. Well, Canada is a bit on the cold side, but still. My point is, in 90% of the places in the Palearctic, these species will survive the winter, they are quite tough. But what's important is they really need a stable temperature. No fluctuations, so it, it doesn't matter if it's minus 10 degrees or, um, or, or plus 10 degrees Celsius basically. Many people are obsessed about the temperature that you need, but that's actually not important. It's important that it doesn't fluctuate too much. And this is follows nature. So let's have a look at the species in here. Oh, if you want to see some pretty insects, this is going to be a pretty boring video. Because I'm just going to show you tubes of eggs. So let's see what we have in here. My little treasure. So first of all, in this little tube here. Here we have a very common moth that's found in Europe. It's called the Black Arches. Limantria monacha, and it feeds on pine tree among other things. So um, maybe you remember my video of the breeding of the Limantria dispar from last year, the gypsy moth, and that breeding was quite interesting, and it got me interested in the genus of Limantria. Uh, Limantria are very common moths all around the world, usually, although there are a few more obscure species, but. Um, there's more species of them than you expect, about uh, over 100 species, I think. And they're very important to the field of entomology because some of them are horrible invasive pests. And it's very good to study their ecology because it's, it's both economically and culturally significant. And it's just very interesting to immerse myself in this genus. Now, I think this the English name for this moth is the Clifton non pareil. I have no idea why or how they named it and what it means. But the scientific name is Catocala fraxini, which is a large Erebidae species. Now, Erebidae are also new for me, new for my YouTube channel. But again, if you followed my channel, you've seen uh, I've uploaded the Tias Juno breeding this year. And also um, some other things like the... Uh, I think it's called the, the, the Pale Green. I don't know. Uh, Ophusia tiaki. Um, so I, Erebidae are relatively new for me, I'm not very experienced with breeding them. I mean true Erebidae, not tiger moths and tussock moths, true Erebidae. 
Um, but I really like the breeding of teals, you know, and I would like to try more catocalas and species like this in the following season. So we have Catocala fractionia and uh, Limantria monaga. Let's see what we have here. Um, let me think about this one for a second. I may remember what they are. Okay, let's go to the next one. I, I forgot the name of that one. But uh, well, the one we are holding here is quite interesting. This is a Caligula species from uh, Asia called Caligula tiberta. And the eggs of this particular species came from Taiwan. So it's the subspecies that's endemic to there, I believe, Caligula tibeta okurai. Correct me if I'm wrong. And this is also an interesting one. This is a very common species. But I never bred it. It's the Orgia antica. Um, now the Orgia antica, I think the English name is the vapor moth. It's an extremely common moth in all of Europe. It's extremely polyphagous and easy to breed. But it's really nice looking. And what's interesting is the females are brachypteris. That means they have literally no wings. They're just a body with legs. And the males do have wings. And they locate the females by smell. And they pair really easily in captivity. They respond strongly to her pheromones. So that's really nice to see. And it's also cool to see wingless females. I like that. It's unique. And the caterpillars are cool looking and just low effort and easy. Now in this bag, here, here we have a Leupa moth. You know Leupa, there are these really nice yellow looking Saturnidae. And these also came from Taiwan. It's the Leupa mirandula. Leupa mirandula. As for what's in this tube, I really can't remember right now. But I suspect this is an old tube that's not supposed to be in here. I think they are old eggs from last season that didn't hatch. And I forgot to take them out. They look pretty dead. Okay. So I'm going I guess I'm gonna take them out. But um these species really survive well in these tubes. I never had any problem with eggs dying. I did have problems with eggs hatching too soon in spring when it's unusually warm, but that can happen to everyone. My opinion, this method is 100 times better than overwintering anything in the fridge, because the fridge can dry them out, it can kill them, um, it can make them hatch too early. Most species don't like the consistent uh, cold out there in the fridge. I mean, if for some reason it kills them, I think it has like a desiccating effect. But I'm sure there are other factors at play that we don't really fully understand. So that's basically the, the old gist of my video, showing you how to overwinter eggs. And I've also ordered more, a few Caligula species, a uh, few Catocala species. So it's going to be great. Actually, I just remembered what these are. These are Catocala as well. How could I forget? Um, the scientific name is... Oh man, I forgot it. But it's a Catocala from North America. Uh, it starts with a U, the scientific name. I am uh, sorry for the fact that I forgot. I didn't rec... I should write the names on all these tubes so I don't mix them up. Actually, I'm gonna do that after this video. Because I just noticed I'm already having problems identifying them and that's gonna suck if they hatch and I don't know what it is. I should remember the names well. I guess this is a learning moment for me and for my viewers. If you're overwintering a lot of eggs, make sure to write down the names on the label. Oh, I, I remember, it's Catocala ultronia. Ah, that's it. Really nice looking Catocala with red hind wings. So, uh, that's basically, I'm gonna take this, this bag out, it doesn't really have much value. There we go. Well, that was my overwintering eggs videos. And in preparation for next year, I've also prepared some new host plants. I mean, if you want to keep watching, for some reason anyways, just uh, stay tuned because I'm going to show you some updates. This is a kiwi plant. I know it's currently leafless and also lifeless looking. 
But um, this is the foot plant of some Leupa. The Leupa mirandula that I just showed, actually they are not a grape feeder like most Leupa, but they feed on the fami family of Kiwi, Actinidae. Now there's a fair chance that they will also eat grapevine, and that this is unrecorded in literature. When the eggs hatch, I'm also going to give them grape, but I have their original food plant just in case. This dead little old twig here, it's an uh, acacia tree, and believe it or not, it's doing well in this climate. Of course, during winter it shrivels up, but when spring comes, it really produces some nice flowers. That's a good thing. Now, acacia, you don't often get many species that like to eat acacia. Most species that do come from Africa because it's a really common plant there. In Africa you have many Saturnidae that, fo that uh, specialize themselves on Fabaceae trees. From the top of my head, for example, the Hanayoga that I showed on my YouTube channel. But um, also things like Urota, like Urota sinope. Many Lassiocampid moths also exclusively eat Fabaceae plants like Acacia. Oh. Yeah, I know. I have a runny nose. Don't comment on it. Now, if we look in here very, very carefully, we will see this shoot here. It's This is a shoot of bramble. Now, some of you will comment, who in their right minds would want to plant bramble in their own garden? One of the most invasive, well, it's native here. I mean, invasive in the way that just it keeps propagating endlessly. Some people regard it as a pest. But who in their right mind would want to plant one of the most common and annoying plants in the garden? Well, it's actually a special kind of bramble. First of all, uh, it's, it's thornless, okay? So, most breeders will relate that have bred species on bramble. It's a good food plant for some... Uh, well, um, I noticed many leopard moths, they like it, but also some Saturnidae silk moths. For example, Automeris, they like bramble. So, I thought, why not plant a thornless variant? So, that will spare my fingers from a lot of pain. Um, here we have Goesia. It's a relative of the citrus family. Now, you don't get many Saturnidae that like, that like citrus family. Scientific name is Glutacea, but a few do. It's a breeding secret that Epiphora, in fact, Epiphora moths, the caterpillars, they like citrus. Now, actually, in the wild, they eat zissipus and uh, other plants from this family. Not literal citrus, but uh, related ones. But some of them, they like to munch in Goesia. Believe it or not, I think it's possible to raise them some, uh, some on it. Last but not least, I don't breed a lot of butterflies, but it's a great host plant for Papillonidae. Swallowtails, that is. Um, so sometimes when I'm really bored, for, for no reason, I just order eggs of swallowtails and I raise some of them to adulthood. Like um, some of you may remember the blue papilio from uh, Madagascar that I raised before. Well, let's, I raised them on this plant. Here again we have, well, I wouldn't like to call it bramble. But it is in the genus Rubus. It is uh, Rubus phonicolasius, which is another uh, host plant. I think this one came from Taiwan. And in Dutch, we call it like uh, Japanse Weinbes, which means Japanese wineberry. Um, I'm going to experiment with different types of bramble because I noticed very varying results. For example, if you use um, raspberry, Rubus, um, ah, what's the scientific name of raspberry? Man, I should remember these plant names better. But anyways, both bramble and raspberry are in the same plant genus. Interestingly, raspberry produces much better results and much less losses if you rear anything on it. I noticed this. So I thought if the results, if they vary so much, why not plant more bramble species, like the one over there that I just showed, and this one? So the plan is that next year and the coming years I will have many types of bramble and eventually I will find the best type to use for breeding. And here we have another kiwi plant, just because I don't want to rely on just one individual plant for my breeding of Leupa mirandula. I thought may as well plant two. 
Well, here we have a cherry tree. Um, it's edible, like these edible cherries. It's like, um, yeah, I know it's a Prunus. I think it's Prunus avium or something. Here we have an apple tree. This is the Malus domestica. It's a commercial kind. When I studied biology, I uh, visited an apple an apple plantage in the Netherlands. In, in the Netherlands, grows a lot of fruit, and they gave us a young tree. And I planted this. I think this is like four years old or five years old, and it produces really nice apples, really good tasting ones, which surprised me. Um, but for breeding, it's not really a great tree. I noticed that commercial types of fruit trees are not not very good for breeding. For some reason, I, mean, I don't know, maybe this is bullshit, but in my mind, I think they tend to notice the most of their nutrition since they are like cultivated to produce the best fruit as possible. I have raised a few species on here though, um, but mainly the polyphagous species that will eat literally everything. For example, the gypsy moth, Limantia dispar. Yeah, I raised them on this apple tree here. I mean, these moths don't really care about the quality of food, okay? They'll eat anything. If it's, as long as it's green. Here I have another trick up my sleeve. This is for Automeris and for Sysphinx. Um, uh, some types of, uh, well, basically Fabacea eating moths. And it's called um, the Siberian pea tree. Here you go. Siberian pea tree. Here we see the scientific name Karagana arborescens and it grows really nice leaves and it's my theory that Automeris will really like this one. I also heard it thrives and grows really fast in, uh, in Europe if you plant it. I mean I think the origin is Russia and Siberia so it's probably an Asian uh, Eurasian type of tree which means it can handle our climate. And this is it's really good for um, well anything that eats these pesky Fabaceae trees. Like, who who else in their right mind has an unlimited supply of Robinia, of Acacia, of uh, Gleditsia? You know these plants, right? Some types of uh, silk moths they really want to eat this type of tree only. So you gotta be prepared. And my choice was the Karanga. I don't know how it works, but I will test it next year. Here we have a small pathetic hemlock, hemlock uh, fir, it's Tsucha heterophylla. It is my plan to grow this tree to a bigger size, which may take a few years, but I have all the time in the world. I'm just 25 years old. And this will be used to raise the Taiwanese moon moth, the... Um, uh, Today I'm not really good with remembering scientific names. I blame the fact that I, I have the flu. Um, ah, Actios nighthuferi, that's the one. It's, it's one of the smallest wingspanned uh, members of the genus Actias, but really nice and endemic to Taiwan alone. Here we have... Um, let's see, what was this? This is hibiscus. Hibiscus is an underrated food plant. Actually, many Saturni they will eat it, including Atlas moths, Atacus, um, Indian moon moth, Actia selene. And it's also a Malvasea. And I wanted to see if Arsenura can eat it, and uh, maybe other Malvasea feeding moths. So, it's going to be interesting. Now, most Arsenura they don't like uh, Malvasea, but some do. Like the common one, Arsenura armida. They uh, can feed on lime tree and other related species. So there's a small chance it will eat this as well. There's also a big chance it will fail. But life is trial and error, isn't it? Well, that's it for now. Basically a boring video. A boring video of me rambling. But uh, I don't have anything else to upload right now. I'm sorry, guys. Until spring arrives, the insect content will be very scarce, really. Because I don't have many of them. So. Thanks for watching and stay tuned. What's up everyone? Currently we are in my dirty old basement. Which has for some reason too many bikes. I guess it's a Dutch tradition.
to have as many bikes as possible in case one breaks down. So here we have this old door covered with spider webs. And here we have the boxes I used to overwinter species. But not just any species because this basement is actually too warm to overwinter most to most European and American species because we are sitting next to a radiator and when we turn the heating on this radiator it will turn to a nice 20 degrees Celsius or more probably so um, this is not an unheated basement and from my experience if I overwinter some species in here like the European peacock moth or the Japanese uh, oak silk moth, Anteria pernii, Saturnia piri. My experience is they will hatch in the middle of, middle of winter, so that really sucks. However, I found a different use for this space. Because this space is still relatively cold, just not cold enough for most European species. But what we have in here are species from Central America or North America. That come from warm climates. Now that's a very interesting thing because some of these species also need to overwinter. However, because they come from warm climates, they cannot resist cold. So they need to be uh, kept at a stable temperature, around 5 to 10 degrees Celsius to overwinter. But if you colder, keep them colder uh, than this, they will die because they will freeze to death because these tropical species are not really used to cold. On the other hand, if you keep them too warm, they will hatch the same year, which is not a good thing. Uh, actually, so most species from Central America, except especially from Mexico, Panama, etc., these species do experience a very brief and mellow winter. Um, it's not really like the winter we have in Europe, but it does get cold, and in rare cases it can snow or freeze. So, this is the excellent, excellent environment for species like this. I'm going to show you what I'm overwintering. It's really not a lot, but it's nice. See, here we have really big cocoons. See them? Believe it or not, but these cocoons are of an Automerus species. Automerus. This is Automerus metzli. Origin of the livestock is from Mexico. And I've contacted a few experts and they are actually sure that this species can survive a brief cold. Now I'm overwintering them for a good reason, because I'm going to leave my country for two months, very soon. And I would hate for them to hatch while I'm gone, when I'm in another country. That means I will not be there to pair them or take care of them. And I really want to see this moth. Besides, in the winter is really a bad time for breeding, guys. There's no food plants, it's cold, I don't want to go outside to walk in this grey sloppy mess every day. Now, in here we have some smaller cocoons, like these, for example. In here is a really nice species of Leucanella. I forgot what species it was again, but it's a Mexican type of Leucanella. And Leucanella, they they really look like automerus, but it's a different genus. And their larvae look different, and their wing shapes are different, and their ocella are also slightly different. Now, this is one that you may all recognize, probably. This is the um, Caletta silk moth, Eupacardia caletta. Uh, Eupacardia caletta, they can be overwintered. Just, I think they can even take harsher cold than, uh, right, than I'm keeping them in right now, because I'm overwintering them with my Central American species. Actually, Eupocardia caletta is also a Central American species, so let's, get, let's not get that mixed up. But still, they, I think they can handle a colder temperature than most of these other species in there, but I guess I just really didn't want to overdo it. So last but not least in here we have Automerus pupa. There's about 20 of them in here. This is um, a Mexican type of Automerus, the Automerus myonia. Some people confuse them with Automerus franca. franca. The difference is actually difficult to see. 
most experts struggle with identifying them, especially if the geographical location of them is not known, because they look mostly the same. And I keep them a little bit in this substrate here that keeps them humid when I spray it. So that's basically some nice Automerus and Saturnidae species. Um, some of the stuff you can expect to hatch next season if you follow my channel that is. Thanks for watching. And I guess I see you next time. Last but not least. There are some cocoons. Some cocoons. We can go briefly through them. Let's see. They're basically outside in this container here. Exposed to the elements. And I think looking at the container right now, I should probably put them in a bigger container soon. They're kind of packed together quite closely. But it's not an issue unless they hatch. Man, this lid is really annoying. There we go. Quick review. For example, these are Eucalyptus gum moth, Ophodiptera eucalypti from New Zealand and Australia, among other places. As you can see, very hard, tough cocoons. They can survive a cold winter. They don't need to be overwintered, but it helps synchronize their life cycles. So, Ophodipteras, what else we have here? Some hog moths that I raised this year, Smerinthus ocellata, Lotu populi, etc. Now these guys are really common, these are polyphemus moth cocoons, uh, Antarea polyphemus. And the smaller ones are the one Hyalophora species, uh, Hyalophora gloferi. And here are some Saturnia pavonia, European uh, peacock, small uh, emperor, small peacock moth. I think that's like the common name, not entirely sure. Basically some cool and nice and common species, nothing really special. Just wanted to sh show you how I overwinter them outside. I'll cram together in one small box, hey. But uh, if it ain't broken, don't uh, fix it. It works for, uh, for me right now. Probably gonna upgrade these to a bigger container soon, but for today I'm too lazy. And these are all very cold hardy species. Now what's important is uh, just put them in a, an isolated small spot, not directly exposed to the elements. But I put them subtly in here, Oop, in a cricket box, and that's enough for them.